Okay, so hopefully that's just a little break from, <laughs> from looking at slides, but uh, the world is very aware of its impending judgment. And I, I, I don't think it becomes a Christian to deny the possibility of God's supernatural judgment when the world is already aware that it's, it's on its way. They might deny it, um, but it's the duty of the Holy Spirit to convict the heart. And we see again in, in Romans 1 and 2 that they are aware of the truth, but they deny it. Uh, and yes, exactly, Naomi, they are desensitizing the end times. And unfortunately, it's affecting Christians more than it's affecting unbelievers, that Christians are losing faith in God's power of God's omnipotence to bring about the judgments that he has said he will. There are far too many liberal theologians who will strip God of his power in scripture and say that this doesn't have a very good naturalistic reason. We don't need a naturalistic reason because the universe itself does not have a naturalistic cause. It has an uncaused cause, uh, which caused it, and that is God. Uh, so Naomi says, recently I saw an interesting perspective that those movies are satanically or demonically influenced and desensitizing people to these things so that they don't apply to God, but it seems scientific or normal-ish. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I would agree 100%. They always have pseudoscientific explanations in those movies. I would agree. I think that is the purpose of Satan during these last days is to uh, distract us. I, I think it's a demonic distraction. Uh, next week, we're, we're going to look at some of the UFO conspiracies um, and how it's, it's very much in line with what Satan is doing to try to take people's minds off of God and put it onto some sort of cosmological or evolutionistic uh, answer um, to what God is doing. But God is going to make it less and less possible for them to come up with these sort of explanations. By the end of this tribulation period, there will be not one person left on this earth who can deny that God is actively influencing uh, the, their lives here on earth. All right, so four views on what this blood is when this mountain uh, falls into the ocean. Uh, why is there an appearance of blood? And again, people are going to look for a naturalistic explanation for this. Uh, one problem with the idea that it's just the appearance of blood, in other words, that the ocean will just turn a red color, is that this fails the test of maintaining a literal hermeneutic throughout all, all of our interpretation. There is no indication in this verse that this blood is a simile, that it's a metaphor, or that it should be interpreted any way but literally. Um, I believe it will be literal blood, just like the Nile became literal blood. Uh, another, op uh, another possibility is that this blood um, will emanate from the one-third of sea life that dies. Uh, that is not the case in the Nile, we saw that the blood was the cause of the death of one or of the sea life in the Nile. I believe something similar is happening here in the book of Revelation, uh, rather than, yeah, uh, but also there, I, I mean, I don't know how to check the science on this, so I can't say it dogmatically, but I don't think the volume of blood in the sea life in the ocean is equal to one third of the ocean. So if we're going to take God's proportions or, or rations accurately here, um, we would greatly undercut what he is saying explicitly here in the book of Revelation that one third of the ocean would become blood. Uh, I, I don't see uh, the blood of the sea creatures being able to, to meet that tall order. Uh, another one, and a very interesting one, and a view that has captured the fascination of a lot of Bible students, is that it's a chemical reaction with the asteroid that falls into the ocean. One thing I do like about this, um, this view is it accurately identifies the, uh, the burning mountain as an asteroid. However, 
uh, this is kind of an incognito interpretation for a naturalistic explanation. And it actually has its roots in evolution. There is a theory out there that uh, seawater and blood share many similarities. And that is used as an evidence for evolution, that blood uh, evolved from seawater. Uh, it sounds crazy, but people actually um, were taught that, um, especially in the 70s. That was one of the main um, evolutionistic proofs, uh, but it's been summarily dismissed um, now in, in the naturalistic sciences. However, a lot of Christians are still grabbing onto this, and I haven't been able to trace it down, but I would, I would wonder if these Christians who are grabbing onto the chemical reaction theory um, are not Christians who would deny a literal creation, um, those who think that God used evolution to create, um, because they, they will cite things like um, the similarities between blood and seawater. Uh, there, there is no proof that they are similar. Their chemical composition is far too different um, for iron alloys in, in a comet to, to, uh, to balance those. Uh, so no, I, I don't believe it'll be a chemical reaction. Uh, my view is the fourth view here, that it is entirely a supernatural event. This is usually denied for causality. Um, these are all logic terms. Uh, but this causality, it says, uh, well, if the asteroid is not the cause of the blood, then everything that happens needs to have a cause. Uh, well, this does have a cause, just like the asteroid has a cause, just like the hail, fire, and um, blood in the previous judgment has a cause. Its cause is God's judgment. So although that doesn't fall into our naturalistic explanations in a postmodern world, or actually a modern world, postmodernism, I'm not sure what they would do with that, but um, it's, uh, it's a logical fallacy to say that it has no cause, only its cause is supernatural, not naturalistic. And then uh, along with this, we see that not only is there a a large mountain, but what is the effect of this um, comet striking the ocean? The effect is that one third of the ships are destroyed. Now, uh, these numbers are old. They are not up to date. But even a couple of years ago, I think this was from 2018 or 2019. Obviously, it'd be different right now for COVID. But um, in 2018 or 19, whenever this picture was taken, there were 90,000 commercial ships on the ocean. And this is only commercial ships. This is not counting private vessels. Um, so we would see upwards of 30,000 commercial ships uh, being destroyed. Now, again, we're nearing the midway point of the tribulation. Probably will not be as much economic activity on the earth after wars, famine, massive death. We already saw a quarter of the population die. So these numbers will, uh, without doubt, be lower um, unless the population increases uh, incredibly between now and um, the tribulation. Uh, but still, we're, we're talking about an immense amount of ships and probably um, not an amount of ships that are able to be destroyed only by a tidal wave uh, created by this, uh, this comet. That could be the case, but uh, also imagine being at Point Nemo in the Pacific Ocean and suddenly the water turns to blood. Do you think you're going to make it back to shore alive? I don't think so. Two, uh, two weeks or so traveling through thick um, blood with death and all sorts of things rotting around you. I don't think anyone on that ship makes it alive to, to shore. Uh, this does have some similarities with the second bold judgment from Revelation 16. However, uh, they are not parallel events. They are not exactly the same. It's a growing of intensity. So see it here in the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. 
So we are seeing the remaining two thirds of the ocean turning to blood here. We're not seeing the same event spoken of another time. We're seeing that what God put restraints on during the trumpet judgments, he is removing all restraints during the bowl judgments. Uh, and again, God is the sovereign creator. Not only does he have the right, but he has the power um, to judge the living creatures in the sea and the seas themselves. Uh, we see in Genesis 1, 20 to 21, that God created everything that fills the earth, that it says, uh, let the waters teem with the swarms of living creatures. Uh, all of these creatures, God does judge. He judges them because of the curse, because of the fall, because man has tainted the entire cosmos with sin. And it was from the very first sin that the entire cosmos was tainted. So God is not unjust in bringing these judgments against sea life and against plants, trees, and animals just as well as he is just in bringing them against mankind. But uh, we do see that a new creation is uh, prepared for those who have been saved out of this judgment. Revelation 21, verse 1, we see that then I saw a new heaven, this is John speaking, and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Uh, now, I do find it interesting that he is mentioning the sea here. Uh, that's why I, I posted it uh, in this section, because this is a polemic against the sea. Um, and yet, in the new creation, there won't be a sea. Uh, so I found this very interesting. There's not a whole lot we know about uh, the pre-flood earth, how it was composed, uh, what its topography was like. We know the... Uh, we know the Garden of Eden, which was just a subsection of that pre-flood earth. Uh, they had rivers, but again, no mention of a sea or an ocean. It's uh, more likely scar tissue from the flood that we have these vast oceans. So uh, we see that that will, uh, even the scar tissue from the flood, but also um, the sea that was turned to blood we see in the new heavens and the new earth. There isn't even a sea. Um, all right, our third sea or our third trumpet is called Wormwood. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Now, wormwood is not a poisonous plant, but it is a plant found in Israel. Uh, and uh, oh, I guess I just found this interesting. Most of these judgments also come from above. Uh, the hail, fire, and blood were thrown from heaven. The burning mountain falls from the heavens. This great star falls from heavens. Now, in the heavens, the sun, moon, and stars are affected, affecting the earth. Uh, in, in the fifth trumpet, it begins with a star falling or having fallen. Uh, pretty much only the sixth uh, trumpet judgment has nothing to do with, uh, with things outside of our uh, atmosphere. But anyways, that aside, uh, this star is called Wormwood. Now, this star isn't wormwood itself. It's not the plant that grows in Israel, uh, but it's called wormwood. That's the Greek word legatai, uh, which is the present passive indicative. This passive is important because uh, it's being given the attributions of wormwood, um, but this is likely the name for it that John heard. He's using this passive to indicate that this subject, Wormwood, is being affected by some unknown object. He is likely hearing other people or other things in heaven referring to this as Wormwood. Uh, so this legatai um, seems to be indicating uh, how he came about this information. 
it was called by someone else and he is simply reporting what he heard. Uh, but we see this, this name, Wormwood, is a corollary with something that God used to judge um, Israel. So in Jeremiah 9, 13 to 15, uh, Jeremiah writes, the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it, but have walked up after the stubbornness of their heart and after the bales as their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them this people with wormwood and give them poisoned water to drink. So although the plant wormwood is not poisonous, we see in scripture, it is correlated with poisons or poisoned waters. Um, it might make us think of uh, the Israelites traveling through the wilderness and they come about the waters of Meramah, which are uh, sour waters. They can't drink those waters, but they are thirsty and in need of water. So God miraculously uh, purifies these waters using, of course, Moses and Aaron. Uh, but we see here the opposite, that whatever God is doing here with this, uh, this great star falling from the heavens, which is likely an asteroid, we see that it is affecting their drinking water to the point that the drinking water becomes toxic um, for people drinking it. Now, a third of the water is a lot of fresh water. A lot of the earth, uh, a lot of the population of the earth already does not have enough fresh drinking water. Uh, I think that's why men are going to drink it anyways. Uh, I mean, just think of Africa, and I know in places in Vietnam and in South America that I went, People said, don't drink the water, drink bottled water. Uh, it's going to be even worse here during the tribulation period with this supernatural event that will poison a third of the remaining fresh water on the earth. Uh, again, this wormwood connotes poison, although the plant wormwood itself is not poisonous, but it is bitter. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, behold, I am going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous water. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth into all the land. Um, so we saw, see here that the way God chose to judge Israel in the past, he's going to similarly judge the earth in the future, um, all those who dwell on the earth. Um, but here he gives it a purpose statement that the reason he's using this judgment is because of the pollution of man. But he is not speaking here of garbage physical garbage pollution, but of spiritual pollution. Uh, so they're basically reaping what they've sown, uh, but in a physical sense where they're, they sowed spiritual seeds and they're reaping physical seeds in the judgment of God. Uh, and then the third bowl judgment does have some similarities here, but again, it increases during the bowl judgments where here we see only one third of the rivers affected uh, during the third bowl judgment, we're going to see that all of the rivers and springs of waters will become blood. But again, there is, uh, we're, we're given some more information here on this one. We get some angels speaking and uh, essentially uh, justifying what God has done in his judgments here. So we get the angel saying, righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things. So we're seeing that heaven recognizes his judgments as righteous, and despite their intensity here. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, remember back to the fifth seal, and you have given them blood to drink, they deserve it. Um, we can go back to Genesis 4, verse 7, uh, with the blood of Abel crying out from the ground. Uh, so all the way back to the beginning of history. And I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The altar here is, um, can't remember the, the figurative speech that this is called, but the altar is referring to the people who we've seen associated with this altar, which are the martyrs. 
So we see finally in Revelation 16, these judgments are winding up to a conclusion. And the trumpets and these bold judgments are all going to be included within this judgment that God is bringing on the earth for the prayers of the saints, of the martyrs, um, who were martyred during the time of the tribulation specifically, and broader um, to those whose blood has been, um, who has been spilled. Uh, but again, we, we do have later in the book of Revelation, uh, our hope where the world sees judgment coming on it, the church sees hope. Um, so in Revelation 22, 1 through 2, looking at uh, the new Jerusalem, which will be our eternal home. John writes, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets, on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the earth will endure uh, a will endure judgments against their water sources, um, but we have this hope and this offer, and whoever is reading this book of Revelation, who does not at this point, or who is not at this point saved and in a right position with Jesus Christ through faith in Jesus Christ, um, will be able to look essentially here at their two options. Uh, having this natural world and everything that they hope in in this world stripped from them, or being promised an eternal dwelling with Jesus Christ where everything stripped from the tribulation generation uh, will be given in excessive abundance um, to those who have trusted in Jesus Christ. Finally, our fourth angel is going to sound, uh, and we see that uh, the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Uh, so again, the, the language here is a bit hard to be precise on uh, what exactly will happen here. Some think that the spin of the earth is going to be affected possibly by these asteroids so that the earth speeds up and our days are one third shorter. Uh, I don't really see this as um, a good explanation. Again, it's trying to find a domino effect between these judgments where the previous judgments are going to cause this judgment, that's actually not finding a pattern that's destroying the pattern. The pattern is each one of these judgments is a specific judgment that comes from, um, from God through these trumpet uh, or through these angels who are announcing these judgments. I do believe this is, again, a supernatural event. Uh, where the Lord is going to reduce the, um, the, uh, the brilliance of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, okay, bye, Karin. We'll see you next time. Uh, what, sorry, what time is it? Oh, yeah, we've gone a while. Okay, uh, the sixth seal. Uh, sh uh, okay. So we're, we're looking at the sun, moon, and the stars here in the heavens. In Revelation 6, um, under the sixth seal, we saw that the stars of the sky fell to the earth, um, that the moon uh, became like blood, and the sun was made as black as hair, or sackcloth made of hair. So here we come to uh, another judgment where now the sun, the moon, and the stars are darkened. So we understand that when these stars fell from the sky, it did not mean that every single star that is in the sky fell. Remember, they are not the stars that we see in the sky, but rather asteroids that are using the same word as stars in the Greek. Um, and as well, the, the moon and the um, black sun, these were not permanent conditions on the sun and the moon but conditions that lasted for the duration 
of the sixth seal. When the seventh seal began, at least by that time, uh, the sun would have returned to some semblance of normality, as well the moon. Uh, but here under the, um, under the fourth trumpet, we see that they are again affected. And this time, rather than changing color, uh, they are being dimmed. Uh, they will no longer have the power uh, that they have had before. Uh, and I mean, think of sun worshipers like the Japanese pre-industrialization, uh, pre-war even, uh, who worship the sun and its power. Now, there are still cultures that worship the sun. Uh, and when that is affected by the hand of God, they will recognize that God is more powerful than their God. We think of Egypt, um, God against Dagon, where, uh, where the Moabites, I believe it was the Moabites, saw that the one true God of Israel was stronger than the God they worshipped. Uh, here, this is similar again to the ninth plague on Egypt. Uh, is this the ninth plague? Yeah, the ninth plague. Uh, in Exodus 10, we see that uh, darkness is going to come on uh, Egypt, but it bears the dwelling place of the sons of Israel. Uh, now, although this has some correlation with this process of darkening in the fourth trumpet judgment, it's, it's actually closer, um, parallel, more closely paralleled with uh, one of the bowl judgments in Revelation 16, the fifth bowl judgment is going to be darkness specifically on the kingdom of the Antichrist. Uh, and it's a darkness that will be felt. Um, so this is almost a direct parallel with uh, the ninth Egyptian plague. So we see again, just as the Egyptian plagues grew in intensity, we might see some repetitive uh, judgments, but they are growing in intensity. And that is the purpose that they are showing God's power. Uh, to the entire earth. And again, God is the sovereign creator. He created the sun, moon, and stars, uh, and he gave them their purpose, and he is perfectly capable through his power to reduce the light that they give, and he is perfectly justified in doing so as well. Uh, that's the same. And uh, again, when we look into our future hope, uh, together with the Lord for eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. Um, again, uniquely, these divine instruments of judgment that man has worshipped throughout history, we will see that they are not present in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, so speaking of the new Jerusalem, he writes, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Uh, the new heavens and the new earth will not be a mere copy of this, uh, of this cosmos. Rather, it will be uh, particularly attuned to our dwelling permanently with the Lamb, who is a light far more brilliant than the sun. All right, our last verse in this chapter uh, is prefatory to what comes next in uh, the remaining chapters uh, until chapter 18. So we see, and then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Uh, this mid heaven scripture often speaks of three heavens, uh, one heaven being within our atmosphere, another being outside of our atmosphere, but still within physical space, and the third heaven being uh, the dwelling place of God. So this mid-heaven uh, is speaking of in the same realm as the comets uh, that are coming from space this eagle that is flying in the midheaven is not flying in our atmosphere. He's flying outside of it. This is obviously a supernatural event, but not one that we should take any less than literal. And also this eagle 
Uh, it is the Greek word for an eagle, just like um, our earthly uh, permutation of the eagle. The King James Version, I think, tried to correct the manuscript and instead of translating eagle, translated angel. Uh, there's no manuscript evidence that this should be translated as an angel. Um, it is an eagle. And eagle does fit the context um, because this is both uh, speaking of judgment, but also uh, it, it carries with it the idea that God does save his people out of um, harm. But this eagle is, uh, is prefacing the remaining three trumpet judgments. These trumpet judgments that remain are going to be so terrible um, that they are uh, paused at this point, and we're given a direct warning that what's to come is incomparable to what we've already witnessed. Um, so these three trumpet judgments uh, we're going to start looking at next week. But the idea of this eagle as a harbinger of judgment is consistent throughout scripture. In Habakkuk 1.8, uh, we see this imagery that their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horses come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. So we see it as a bird of prey in the imagery of scripture. In Exodus 19.4, uh, God correlates the eagle uh, to his uh, power to bring um, Israel out of Egypt to save them out of harm. God says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, we're, as we progress through Revelation, we're going to see how God does protect his remnant in Israel. So this, um, this eagle does carry um, all of this scriptural baggage, for lack of a better word, uh, from the preceding 65 books of scripture. Uh, we don't want to dislocate it from uh, the rich imagery that it is giving to us, while also remembering that this is a literal, or at least literal in some way, that we can't understand. But John saw what appeared to be an eagle uh, flying in space. Uh, and uh, finally, the the purpose of this wrath we, we see in Romans 1, 18 through 25, that uh, the earth is already uh, meriting this judgment, even back in Paul's day, 200 years of world history proceeding from uh, the writings of Paul has not done anything to, uh, to alleviate this wrath of God. In fact, it has only given God more fuel for the fire. Uh, so we should not be, uh, we shouldn't be boggled by these judgments. They are perfectly just and they are not too extreme. In fact, we see that God is even restraining himself in these judgments so that his purpose might be fully wrought throughout these seven years. Um, we've read a lot of these verses already tonight, so I'm skipping through them. All right. The trumpet judgments, uh, in conclusion, the first four seal judgments are against Mother Nature, who man has worshipped through history in lieu of God. The judgments are supernatural, emanating from the throne of God. Uh, they are announced by the trumpets. These judgments are restricted to one third. They are prefatory to the much greater and more complete judgments yet to come. All right, so that is. Uh, it for chapter eight. Are there any questions? No questions, eh? <clears throat> There's one question in the chat. Oh, there is. I'll go grab that. Okay. Naomi asks, is the new Jerusalem the millennial kingdom, or is it after the total destruction of the earth and the new earth? Uh, the new Jerusalem is what we call the eternal state. Uh, it's after the millennial kingdom, and it is when the throne of David will merge with the throne of God. 
and Jesus Christ and God will rule together over all of creation. The purpose of the millennial kingdom is for a theocratic king to rule on God's behalf over this creation, because that was God's purpose in creating mankind in the first place. So unless God is victorious in that realm, uh, then Satan has won on this earth. It's impossible that Satan win on this earth. Um, God will be victorious. God will have his perfect ruler on this earth, and that will be Jesus Christ. After that rule is complete, after he has um, brought about all of his promises to Jerusalem and to the rest of the world uh, through the promised uh, seed, who is Jesus Christ, then at that point, this earth can pass away, but not until God has been entirely victorious over all of his uh, creation mandate. So that will be the purpose of the millennial kingdom. It will immediately proceed uh, the, the final judgments of the tribulation. Um, there's about, a, I think, a 35-day gap. Um, we get that gap from um, the, the book of Daniel. Um, I could ferret that out a bit more if you guys want to know where it is. Uh, there's a 35-day gap between the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial kingdom, during which time God is probably cleansing this earth from the judgments uh, that came on the earth um, so that we will be in a partially restored earth. Uh, we see parts of the curse are also lifted. Um, you can go to Isaiah 65 to see um, some of those aspects of the curse that are taken away during the millennial kingdom, but some will still remain. Um, my personal understanding, it's not the understanding of everyone, is that the curse will be uh, removed to different degrees for um, believers and for unbelievers during the millennial kingdom because there will still be people born into mortal bodies during the millennial kingdom and those will have the responsibility to come to Jesus Christ the King um, in faith. Um, but unfortunately, we'll see when we get to Revelation 20 that many, many, many of those uh, mortals born during the millennial kingdom will rebel against Jesus Christ when Satan is released for a short time at the end of the millennial kingdom. But at that point, uh, we will have, uh, there, there will be the great white throne judgment of Jesus Christ where all of the living, or, or all of the, um, the wicked dead will be judged, and that will include um, that rebellion during the millennial kingdom. Uh, they'll be judged and, uh, and condemned to eternal conscious uh, punishment in hell, which is unthinkable to me personally, uh, perhaps to you as well, that uh, right now we, we seek the Lord through faith. He said to, to Thomas, uh, blessed is he who believes without seeing uh, but during the millennial kingdom, there will be absolutely no excuse. Uh, even now, there's no excuse. But during then, um, Jesus Christ will be a present physical reality on this earth, ruling over the earth as a man. And yet they will still deny him, not his existence, but they will deny him uh, his saving power rather than trusting in him. What's that noise? Satan. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right. So hopefully that answers your question, Naomi. The new Jerusalem is after the millennial kingdom.